The following preview is rated PG. Every holiday season deserves a great story. Join a young girl named Charlie as she struggles with her own personal loss while being swept into a whole new world filled with action, mystery, danger, and high stakes adventure. Aunt Nani? Aunt Nani? Come along, you two. She doesn't need our help. Well, what do we have here? Look out, Mift! Incoming! Another human child has arrived. See, now that is interesting. We don't mean you any harm. We've been sent by Adeline. You are what I say you are. Then I suppose I'll have to do something about it. I would not be so dismissive were I as weak and careless as you. <laughs> this holiday season, join Happy Go Lucky and all of our friends from the gigantic adventures of Jeff and Simon Dice Tower Theater, Elderberry Tales, Pitchforks and Pomegranates, Kid Cryptid, Drive With Us, Top of the Round, Podcast Reviews, Reviews Podcast, Unnecessary Evil, and many more as we bring the next holiday classic to life. Very bright. Very bright. Very bright. Subscribe now. Charlie Saves Christmas, an audio drama podcast. Open soon. You'll just have to come back for it. <laughs> and now, our feature presentation. <laughs> Dawn of Dragons, Season 1, Episode 6. The waves rocked the bow like a whale's deep heartbeat. Benedict smiled, looking out across the white crested waves as they cut a swath through the cerulean and azure ocean. The smell of kelp and sand days behind was replaced with a familiar charcoal and iron as he bent the three-inch O-ring into place on the anchor. Jolif, the pewter and onyx-haired minotaur, looked on with interest as he skillfully drove the hammer in steady blows, driving it to its proper form. Huh. There's a grace in what you do, Benedict. He said, gripping one hand on his notched saber. Thank you. The word seemed to push the seven-foot giant into a state of peace. The scars on his face softened, and the veins on his muzzle relaxed a bit. The thanks is ours, Jolith. Benedict firmly pulled the glowing iron from the coals to place around the horn of the anvil. My family is grateful for the passage to Bells. Jolith nodded. He raised a hand to a female minotaur who nodded back. She was on the other side of the wide deck next to the beige-clad Zane, his dark cloak being left below in the sun, and looking across the waves to the west. Kiri, do you think we all have a place here in this world? Of course. She stood straight, and her eyes smiled. We all have our place. The water is life. She grinned, putting her hand on his shoulder. But battle... She smiled. Battle too is life, my friend. She paused. Is it not the same for you? To meet an enemy is one thing, but to clash steel together in combat... She took in a deep breath and gripped the axe at her side. That is when you know a man. He looked at her. Just a man. What about you? She laughed. <laughs> what of me, my friend? Her eyes softened. Is it because I am female or a minotaur that you question? Man, minotaur, orc, even the halfling. Do we not all revere the sea? Zane nodded. She drew closer. He could see the bay-colored fur around her muzzle brush gently in the salty, warm air. The sea is a battle upon itself, the oldest battle. Am I right? Zane, the storm on the sea isn't good or bad. We just know that with it we travel, but against it will bring tragedy. He looked confused, and she smiled again. Not all is as it seems, Mr. Shieldheart, nor is its intention as clear as we wish it to be. Ride your waves. Don't just fight them when they seem to oppose you. <laughs> this, this will keep you from drowning. Zane smiled. 
Clapping her sinewed and taut cannonball-like shoulder in a broad smile, he looked to the rigging above. Full sails whipped above him in the noonday sun providing some shade. Zoran looked to the rigging as well, standing to the rear and port end of the ship, his arms aching from restocking the six-foot-long harpoons by the ballista. Each was fletched with a triad of stiff leather fins, tarred with a dark pitch that, once cool and dry, could withstand the water spray or impact. Last night, the bindings must have broke loose in the afternoon squall, sending the steel tip bolts sprawling. There wasn't that much cleanup, he noted. This was actually the last of it. He looked to the ship's armament, the ballista, two eight-foot crossbow erected at the rear of or aft defense with two more fore or front on either side of the bow. All four corners. They were all set. Excellent. He hoped it wouldn't come to it, but he had used these to repel borders or even once a huge sea serpent threatened to capsize the Mako, the last ship he served on. The truth was, that was the inspiration behind Cordelia's ivory dragon he had carved until four weeks ago He had no idea what a dragon truly looked like. He had a memory of a painting mixed with the reptilian face of that 80-foot serpent. That was what he had assumed they all looked like. He thought of the skeletal visage of that black dragon and the blue with its swept thin horns. He paused. Fury. (laughs) He thought of the huge red dragon his father had partnered with. A partner? (laughs) He still nervously pondered. Was he jealous? Jealous Fury had access to that respect he dreamed about? That he hoped his father still retained some level of humanity beneath it all? He shook his head. No. Only partner he has is in death himself. As he felt the taut fibers of the thick hempen cable of the ballista's bowstring, he noted the panels of yew with a core of ash making up the arms. An eight-spoked hand crank could be used by one person in a pinch, but that would take a lot of strength. He looked out across the waves. El Aviv. He thought of her on the rooftop, firing arrow after arrow, as he and Cordelia ran from the orcs, rushing through the courtyard, Sophie fighting furiously. He saw Fury facing her, and her proud, defiant face. He thought of himself younger, asking her, Well, where are we going to go now? The deck of the ship rocked heavily enough to jar loose a barrel rolling across the deck. Shouts began to come from the crew. This time it was much harder and definitely came from underneath. Zorn ran to the port side, seeing a huge dark shape, much like an egg, but a size similar to the ship itself, pass under the hull, huge spikes protruding from it. The deck groaned and heaved starboard. The captain appeared from the rear door to his quarters and ran up the stairs to Zorn. Sophie followed from the mainmast. What do you see, lad? Fear racked Zorn as he realized with much certainty. Whale? Well? Sophie said as much as question next to him. Good guess, but no, that was a dragon turtle. The captain stamped and clapped his hands. Bah, of all the rotten luck. Those things are so greedy. If they sense the gold on that little necklace of yours, even they won't stop until they take it. All for its rotten nest in the deep. He looked to Jolith and pointed above. Jolith turned to Zane. All right. <laughs> hey. All right, full sails, brothers, eh? <laughs> Zane nodded and ran across the slick deck to the mainmast. He was skilled at climbing, bounding up the iron rings to the first and largest of sails. These were already dropping from two shirtless, deep-toned sailors straddling the long arm. The wind was filling them, the mast groaning under the strain. He spun to keep going, his foot gripping the first iron rung, and then the next hands reaching for the rungs above to the next sail. The shock hit the ship full force, rocking everything starboard. 
Stand back! Bendik had long since extinguished the coals of the forge, but his heart fell when the door flew open, spilling the remnants of warm black ash to the deck. No fire followed. Thank you, Night Lord, for your mercy. He looked up and saw his brother 40 feet in the air from the swaying deck. He was untying the upper sails, freeing them. They flared below him as they took flight. Zane swung back to the mainmast with a cat's grace, descending quickly. Cordelia ran up to Benedict. It's a huge dragon turtle. She was both terrified and excited at the same time. Benedict's heart dropped as he remembered the red eyes of the sword's pommel. The pommel of the sword that killed his adopted father, Erebus. They sprawled to keep their footing. He looked to Zane. He had barely reached the lowest oh, sails when he saw him lose his grip and plummet 20 feet to the hard deck with a thump. Zane! His brother's form was still on the deck as he ran to his side. The huge maw of the dragon turtle came up and over the top of the deck. The smell of rotten fish and hot steam overwhelmed him. It drew in a deep breath, but it roared in pain as a six-foot pole stuck out of the nape of its thick, leathery neck at the base of the jagged shell. Benedict was horrified. Frozen in place, alone in the center of the deck, mere feet from the appetite of this enormous monster. While standing in front and protecting his brother, he weighed his options. Zane! He looked back at Cordelia. Her eyes were enormous. Talk to him? He was dumbfounded. What? He swore she had just mouthed out for him to talk to it. He turned as the huge maw dropped down to his level on the deck. Its huge dark blue eyes peering into his soul's being. Its lips pulled back, revealing the rows of jagged teeth when- Wait! What do you want? The dragon turtle's dark green face turned. An eye opened, and it said, Help me. Time stopped. Zoran froze behind the ballista. Cordelia's face was contorted with a confused smile. Sophie buried her face in her hands. The captain dropped the pipe from the corner of his mouth to the deck with a thunk. What are you doing? Benedict <clears throat> kicked Zane before he ruined one of the most amazing and precarious conversations of their lives. How can we help you? It motioned at the harpoon in its neck. <sighs> It lowered itself onto the deck, swaying the ship to one side. When Benedict cautiously approached it, past the giant maw, now relaxed, past the blue eye looking at him pleading, he could hear the deck groan under the weight of the giant. He gripped the two-inch thick pole and pulled sharply and quickly successfully freeing it from its neck with a groan. Thank you. My friend. Zoran looked at Sophie sheepishly, shrugging, feeling a great bit of guilt. Why are you here? Benedict questioned. Elves. Sea elves. Stole something from me. And I thought you might be with them. We know of no sea elves. Thank you. My friend, please, if you hear of an onyx conch shell, please come back to this spot and tell me. Benedict nodded. The huge beast, as quickly as it had come, then slid off the deck into the water, returning the ship to right itself, bobbing on the sea. The dinner table was eerily silent that night. No one could truly understand what had just taken place, and it was easier to just ignore the insanity. 
They stared blankly into the shallow wooden bowls, cradling a few stewed potatoes and a chunk of fatty salted pork. Using a stale roll to mop up the starchy brine, they then chased it with a bitter flat ale. Or water, if you were, in Benedict's place. The stale air was moist and dank in the mess below deck. The myriad of smells from the cooking, thyme, and lemon scent was welcome amongst the strong musk and salt their bodies smelt of after the day. Adding to it was the captain's pipe smoke. We have six days till we make it to Bells. Provided the winds stay favorable, you'll be ready to start your new lives. The captain nodded at Zorin. Thanks again, lad. Thank you, Captain Triscuit. Zorin smiled and went back to his potatoes, knowing they tasted sweeter for some reason. Three days and they land in the great and rich country of Bells. Cordelia knew the most about the clerics known as the librarians of the Ivory Library. She said there would be a price to use and research the knowledge they protected. It said if you need to know something, they know that very thing. There's little that is not known by the librarians. She had paused on the deck of the ship, he remembered, clutching the ivory statue he had made her. He noticed the face fading a bit, worn where her thumb caressed it, worriedly. I will approach them and request entrance, as I'm the only one versed in the arcane ways. She turned to him. We will get our answers. He chewed slowly as he looked from the table to the corner of the room where Sophie sat with a limp Zane cradled in her arms across her lap. He chuckled inside. They both claimed to not be hungry, and it was the first time since the first embrace over a month ago that they were really seen together. I'm dying, Sophie. Sophie was mopping his cut and bruised brow with a cool, herbal mint-smelling rag. Zane. No, really, I feel like everything's growing cold and dark. Just... She smiled and shook her head gently. Shut up. for listening to this episode of Dice Tower Theater's Dawn of Dragons. This week's episode featured some very special guests from some of our favorite podcasting friends and family. Please keep listening to hear their promos here following our heartfelt thanks. You can find links to their shows in the episode notes. The Captain was played by Daniel from the Happy Go Lucky podcast. The Dragon Turtle. Chris from the Amazing Wildlife podcast layered with samples by Sword Coast Soundscapes. You can find Sword Coast Soundscapes on YouTube. We release episodes every three weeks, so be sure to subscribe or follow us on most social media. Transcriptions, merchandise, and more information can be found at Dicetowertheater.com. Stay tuned for Episode 8, What Secrets Await Them Within the Walls of the Ivory Library. Dice Tower Theater is a proud member of the family-friendly Potacon Go Network. Take a journey with amazing wildlife as we explore the many creatures found in the world around us. Each episode, the animals are the star as we highlight three species with fun and insightful facts in an audio documentary style presentation. Listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, as well as our website, AmazingWildlifePodcast.com. Join us for the show dedicated to the wonders of the animal kingdom, Amazing Wildlife. In a world where there are only pigeons. You awaken what appears to be a small town jail cell. Well, golly, you all look important. I'm like a superhero. Well, I'm surprised you haven't heard of me. Yo, yo, what's going on, man? This is crazy. We came to rescue you. We need to find something. But he's dressed in all black. This is a, this is a mining operation here, children. 
I have never been in here. You're gonna have to hold my hand here, bud. What's up, my rainbow-colored friends? This tomfoolery will definitely be written in my notes this evening. He says it's back in time. I don't know. It sure is. It's the best in the state. I'm going to throw a smarak. Read your hand one more time and I'm going to give you a high five. Where's Eric? What did she do with Eric? Est-ce que t'es prête pour aujourd'hui? No, 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 no. <laughs> Hey, this is Josh here. Mystery and hilarious adventure await in an actual play format that's clean, fun, and appropriate for the whole family. Join our podcasting family as we create a world together. If you're everything podcast like we are, check out our midweek show called the Lucky Go Variety Show, where we put together short recaps, show our love to our podcasting friends, and dive into the details of our podcast. It's all kinds of good, clean fun on one podcasting channel called the Happy Go Lucky Podcast. Lucky is spelled L-U-K-K-Y. Tune in each week anywhere podcasts can be found.